Hi everyone, I'm so excited to introduce you to my guest today. Today I got Belinda Oda with me. She's the heart based certified yoga and meditation teacher with over 800 hours of yoga teacher training. Um, she's certified in Hatha, Mantra, Tantra, Vanessa, and Yin Yoga, which is like, you know, so many styles. And actually, I love, I think I've tried almost all of them. Anyway, um, I got introduced to Belinda through a common friend who is also a yoga teacher. And she told me that Belinda is doing a lot of goddess work. So, of course, I jumped into um, jump on opportunity to chat with Belinda. And I think it's so awesome to have her to be on my podcast as I'm writing a goddess book, um, the second goddess book, and I'm doing a lot of podcasts related to goddess. So a little bit more introduction on Belinda. She's originally from Australia and currently a citizen of the world. I've heard that she lived in a suitcase the last five years. Um, and before that, um, obviously she had lots of yoga training, but she's also accomplished fashion designer. She's passionate about yoga, travel, and wellness. And that's why she now takes women on beautiful retreats several times a year to North India, South India, and Japan, which I'm going to ask her more about it um, because it sounds really fun and exciting. Um, and uh, she's also experienced women's circle leader. And I definitely want to ask her more about it because I think the community of support is so important for women. And I know she created a safe, welcoming, inspiring space for people to participate, to feel connected. And I think that's something we really need. Um, and she also offers personal business one-to-one -one mentoring. And so that's, that's a lot of work she's doing. So I'm really excited to have you on my show. So welcome, Belinda. Thank you, Sue Wing. I'm really happy to be here. Fantastic. So as I mentioned before, um, Kate um, Pearson, who was also on my podcast um, probably a couple months ago. She was the one who introduced us and she told me about your work, which is um, really a lot to do with um, hosting the Goddess Circle, providing the space for women. So of course I jump on the opportunity. Now, before we get into what you do now, what you do now and how you take people on the journeys, I'm curious to know how did you move from working in fashion design to teaching yoga, running retreats and mentoring women. What was your journey? Like, tell us a little bit about your background story. Yeah, sure. Well, it's, it's, it was probably quite a tumultuous changeover, if I think about the, the merging from fashion into um, spiritual life, which is really the way that I live now and all of the things that I share come from that spiritual aspect of being a yogini, um, which is a female yoga practitioner. So I, I see everything that I do as aspects of yoga. But obviously I had a successful career in fashion design. My last big uh, role in Australia was at Alana Hill. I was the accessories designer and buyer for many years. And then I had another big role in Asia where I was an accessories designer for an international company. Um, so I had a lot of, a lot of me was um, revolving in those days was revolving around ego and success and materialism. And it's kind of the opposite to how I am now. So there was a lot of, uh, quite a long transition. I was thinking about it earlier and it's probably, a bit, it was at least five years of this slow change of shedding layers and um, kind of, rediscovering an essence of me that was there when I was a fashion designer but was it has also kind of it, it's definitely evolved into something um, much more less less oriented towards success and more oriented towards um, helping others and just finding the tools that have transformed and changed and empowered my life and then sharing those with other women so that's yeah, it wasn't, a, I can tell you it was not a smooth journey. It was quite hard to shed the ego in the early days because I was geared for success and achievement and, um, you know, even being a name in fashion is something that's very different from being a presence that's in the yoga world. Mm. So, that's yeah. Really interesting because um, lately I've been obviously doing a lot of research for my book. And I think one thing really struck me about women finding the passion or purpose. It's not like 
oh, so you wake up and you find this calling, so core, and then you spin your world around it. I found it often, it's that you got curious about something or you think something needs to change and you need to investigate, discover, and then you need to develop it a bit more. Like as you said, the transition took years because you know something it's there. You don't know quite what is the form and shape and you know something needs to change, but it's a step-by-step -step process and takes time. And I think there's a deepening process in which not a lot of um, literature that I've been reading, like previously when, I mean, as in also life coaching world, there's a lot of discovery and development. But I think the deepening piece is actually the hardest but essential because your transition require a period of deepening so that you know, you know, eventually there is a purpose, which is probably a more lifelong pursuit over a goal that is not just for yourself, but also have a bigger meaning for others. And that takes time to develop. Very few people would just say, wake up and I want to make a difference in the world and can articulate in what way you can contribute, in what way that interests you or you're capable of. So, I think that's in a way a beautiful journey of unfolding. But if you didn't take the step to shred the layers, you won't come to where you are today. But it's definitely a process. And it's never, I haven't heard like anyone necessarily will have a transformation very rapidly, unless something, you know, a health crisis or something that is slightly different. You got shattered. But often it's a slow period until you you realize what is your maybe your calling and it's never very clear at the beginning like i don't think when you start taking your first yoga class you say i'm going to take women to retreat like <laughs> absolutely not in fact in all honesty it was a 12 year transition so i i would say this year i just turned oh, well, last year i'm 42 and a half now so 42 was a there we in our life we have 12 year cycles and if i look back and of course it was the end of a decade so i reflected on the last decade at the end of last year and this this transition was five years that was quite tumultuous because my sense of self was embedded in my fashion career and but the universe the goddess had different ideas for me so i fought against that for at least the first three or four years because i i, I mean i knew i had an affiliation with yoga and i knew that i had an affiliation with the philosophy and i started to get into it and i was really um i had found yoga when i was in when i was 20 before just at the beginning of my fashion career and then I let it go because I was busy with becoming successful and uh, traveling the world as a fashion designer and so it was if I look at the time you know about this year it's 12 years so the last seven years I've merged out of that cocoon of difficulty that was the first five years where I was really I really didn't know, and of course, I knew I was interested in yoga, but I didn't know that I would end up running amazing programs in India and Japan for women only. That, that, was, that seed wasn't there. But in some respects, that seed was there from the beginning of my life because I, uh, all of the things that I do now are a conglomeration or an accumulation of everything that I've done up until now. So even that undoing process of that five years of, changeover um where i finally finally understood by the end of about five years oh i need to i'm moving into something different now i can let go of that, what i was doing before um becoming yeah. ready as well i suppose yeah and, and then and, yeah yeah, yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> you know, like, i'm curious that you know um listening to your journey of transition so within the five difficult years because it's quite a contrast in what you do like uh, some people may have a more like a merging approach but your mm. interests or, or lifestyle would be quite different mm. so in those hardest years what makes you like what keeps you going on and not giving up. I mean, giving up, I don't mean that, oh, I'm not going to develop this knowledge and doing yoga anymore. I don't mean that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, giving up as in, you know, there's something you need to pursue, even at the risk of closing that chapter of your fashion career. You kind of yeah. knew what that's coming. 
And but times were hard. That sometimes we don't have evidence so quickly to show. Well, that that could make a living. That could be my next 10 years. Before we can see and anchor that belief, what kept you moving on and knowing you may risk it all? Well, in all honesty, I think there were several years so that I was just in survival. But the thing that kept me going was this reignited passion and love of yoga that I had touched on when I was younger, but then let go and knew that I wanted to come back to. So as soon as I came back to it, only as a hobby and a passion, I, that was something that became my, um, my focus in my life. So I, I took on other jobs to make money to pay for things and to survive. So as far as survival, I mean that monetarily I was just surviving. You know, I'd come from a successful fashion career and then I came back to Australia from the big job in Asia and the global financial crisis has hit, had hit. And I did get a couple of big roles, but a few major things happened. So the first one, um, I was in a car accident and so I was injured and I wasn't able to, to continue to work. Um, and then the second big role that I got, um, I was fired after three months because I wasn't a cultural fit. So these were huge, huge kind of um, points in the crossroads for me where I started to understand in a difficult way, oh, maybe this is not what I'm supposed to be doing anymore. Mm. But what, what underlied everything was that you know, so I, of course, I found other ways of making other ways of making money to pay the bills. And, um, but all along, I just kept going to yoga classes. And then I kept going to yoga classes. And I started going to workshops. And then I started volunteering at the yoga school nearby me as a, you know, doing karma yoga and, and offering myself as a service to this yoga school. And then I, then I, it just, it just began from there. So it was like this seed of interest and passion and joy that I was getting in my personal life from my hobby, mm. um, which they say, you know, if, you, if you're stuck on what your life purpose is, you can start to look at things that you really enjoyed doing when you're a child. So this type of, I've always was a very kind of introverted, quiet, introspective type of child and I'm very creative. So it was, and, and I loved, and I was a ballerina. So the, all of those things kind of, when I started doing yoga, they're all things that really, really had me feel that essence of purpose that I had as a child as well. Mm. So it was exciting for me just to have that going in my personal life. So I wasn't, I was just plodding away. And, um, and then, organically things evolved but it's not like I had success in a new area anytime soon it took a really long time to establish to re-establish myself in the new way and it's continually changing mm. as I as you said as you as you deepen mm. as I deepen into my um into my as I continue to deepen through my practices and my areas of interest as they change it's just a continual process of shedding and unlearning and learning and sharing. Um, so yeah, long answer, but that's, that's kind of how I got there. Yeah. Not to encourage anyone, but those that who believe after a week long or weekend or certification of any modality of healing or creative and then you're going to score big clients and then you can quit your job the next day. It usually doesn't work that way. People, as in, as I said, deepening is actually the hardest because you know something else is there. I need to pursue. I need to harness my skill or my knowledge or even know what that is. And so you can articulate. It takes time. So or you write a book and you think you'll be instant bestseller. Like they're instant bestseller. <laughs> but actually, if you look at those people's life, they've done a lot of work in themselves or in the world to deepen their, their contribution existence. And then that book become instant bestseller. It's never first you have an instant bestseller, you know? So that's really important. And I think a lot of women can identify with it because let's say for me having a baby right now, you have nine months of nurturing. There's always like a period of becoming. It's never overnight. So, but I think it's rewarding in some way because as you put along 
tiny step at a time, you really appreciate yoga. You really appreciate everything you've learned, the people you met. It, it's sort of, it's kind of like if you didn't have that process, you won't be the teacher you are today. You know, if suddenly from a big fashion job, you jump into big yogi teaching job, <laughs> you just, so what's, what's, what's the journey? What's the becoming, right? Yeah, and there's so much journey in even in becoming a yoga teacher. I mean, you reeled off all of the different types of trainings that I've done. Um, I think it, it, most people's foray into yoga, and it was the same for me, is the physical aspect. But now the type of yoga that I teach is the yoga of living a yogic lifestyle. So it's not just when you get on the mat, it's in every single aspect of your life. So um, being, becoming present, more aware, more conscious of everything that you do, including the types of relationships that you have, what you eat, where, what type of environments you, you live in, what type of things you surround yourself with, they're all, for me now, that's all yoga. There's no separation of I go and do yoga. It is that I am yoga and yoga is me and yoga is everything that I do. Mm. So it's, um, it's this, and if you speak about yoga being a connectedness, so being connected to, to um, that purpose that we talked about, that I, you know, that was a seed in my childhood and then it was, a, it was also a seed in those dark days when I didn't know that that was where I was going to go. Um, but it was there as an enjoyment and a passion. And, and in those days, yes, it was mostly going to yoga classes and practicing asana, practicing meditation and feeling better every time. I, I mean, I don't think that there's anybody that goes to a yoga class and walks out of the class and says, I feel worse for having gone to that class. You always feel better in yourself. You feel more centered, more aligned. So, um, yeah. It's yoga now for me is a lifestyle and that's what I share in my mentoring um, and that's what I share in my retreats. You know, one of my retreats is called Living in Alignment, which is an Ayurveda and self-care retreat in South India and that's um, Ayurveda is the sister science of yoga. And I like to say now that I think if Ayurveda, which is like, it's sort of, it's the Chinese medicine of India, so the herbal medicines and the lifestyle aspects that come from India. So if Ayurveda is the sister science to yoga, yoga's in the middle. I think that the other sister, maybe even the prettier sister, is women's circles. And that's another area that I'm really passionate about these days. And um, Yeah. So um, I need to dig deeper into each of this area because I need to think it was a very good set what you asked you about yogi lifestyle because i didn't know until today yogini yeah. it's a woman yogi <laughs> so um and you touched on the yogi yogini lifestyle but can you tell us a little bit more in the sense that you mentioned so it's about living in alignment i suppose yeah. it's connecting your body mind and spirit so can you tell us a little bit more like more tangible things that you tend to see people who are adopting such a yogini lifestyle. Say you look after your health, you, you do your yoga practice on the mat, you do meditation, you eat according to your dosha maybe, I don't know. Like tell us a bit more exactly yeah. what it includes if we say you got a yogini lifestyle. <laughs> a yogini lifestyle. So a yogini is a female yoga practitioner. So, um, yeah, commonly misunderstood. Lots of classes you'll hear, there's all, mostly all females when you're called yogis. You can be called a yogi, but yogi really is a man. Mm. And, uh, I didn't yogi, know that, so it's really cool. female yoga practitioner. So I like to, you know, I, I identify as a yogini and I teach yogic lifestyle. So, and, and I live a yogic lifestyle. And what that means is that... Um, if we look at uh, the Yoga Sutra, which are kind of the threads or the, the base principles of yoga, then the, the, the two main important ones are two concepts. And one is, you've probably heard, heard them, one is ahimsa, which is non-violence mm -hmm. or non-harming. And then the other one is satya, which is truthfulness. So, so ahimsa, if we look at it in the very basic aspects, it's why most yogis, yoginis, um, have a keep a vegetarian diet so we don't want to harm other animals or other beings in order to sustain ourselves so that's like one basic way of living a yogic lifestyle 
Um, we, as, as living as a yogini for me means that I have daily practices that keep me centered in myself. And um, the practices that I have are a journaling practice in the morning when I wake up and a meditation practice. So those two together take about an hour. Then I'll do a physical yoga practice um, during the day or, uh, or I'll go out for a walk in nature. So I try to stay connected to the rhythms both inside of myself, so my menstrual cycle, the moon that resides inside of me. And I also try to stay in touch with course the cycles of nature the sun and the moon sunrise sunset and also the seasons which are really important um, and so I try to have uh, an awareness a consciousness about everything that I do so many uh, before I start most things I have a moment of connection to myself I try to remain centered I try to keep awareness in my body because the body if we look at the idea of truthfulness or satya the body never lies so the sensation within your body if you stay connected with that you can generally know how you're tracking so it gives you great signals as to whether you need to slow down or whether there's danger or what have you so um, I, I use a lot of connection in with myself and, and the sensations within my body and trying to stay within my body because as women we tend to be very, um, we're, we're known as Shakti, the female energy. So the, the Shakti, which is an amazing force, is what creates life. As you're pregnant, you know, you're creating life in your body and life will come through your body. So it's the most, it's the most beautiful creative process in the world. So that energy um, is a beautiful thing, but it's very chaotic as well if it's not contained by the masculine energy. So I know for myself and for most women, I'm sure you can identify with this, that our energy tends to be going outside of ourselves constantly all day long. So especially as nurturers and natural givers of nurturing to others, um, we often have that energy get dispersed outside of ourselves and we don't take any time to draw the energy back in and center ourselves. So we often feel or get to the stage where we're burnt out or we've overdone it or we don't know how to stop um, or we get PMS or frantic or start having reactionary um, ways of being. So they're all the things that living a yogini, living as a yogini or a yogic lifestyle, we're trying to, in, in many ways, those things are harmful to us, right? So that's not practicing non-harm. Um, by 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 getting by overrunning our systems, so we're trying to stay connected enough most of the day, so that we don't go too much into that extreme overdrive. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't still, you know, I still achieve and create and and have a lot of purpose in what I do and 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 do a lot of things, but trying to do them with more consciousness. And of course, food's a major thing. Getting enough rest is also another major thing. But probably the main thing would be the daily practices and staying connected to the cycles of nature, both within myself and nature that surrounds me. Mm, lovely. It sounds so good just to like listen to your lifestyle. <laughs> like, I don't know, it brings me like calm and peace and centeredness. And I get it, like as in... You know, one thing I like to point out when I get opportunity people is that some people think, oh, the, the, the spiritual people or people who have spiritual practices, they either have all day hanging around and got nothing better to do. And so they can be like meditating, yogi and practicing this and that, and writing journal and all that for hours. Actually, what I think people often have this connotation is that when we have that practices or sentences they, they tend to think spiritual people either have lots of time or they they kind of like don't have enough productive hour to do work actually <laughs> the contrary i think i'm way more efficient and productive by being able to center myself so i have my own practices as well maybe like you know everybody have different style and time and when do you do and how to do it but i actually think the more center and spiritual i have became through the years the more productive, effective, and not doing things that don't serve me, doing useless stuff, and I don't waste as much time. So I would say more the, the person you 
you know, tend to think very spiritual and grounded and they seem to spend too many hours meditating. Actually, they can still write 10 books a year for some reason. It's, because, it's true. You're just more productive and you just don't do things that you're going to delete or useless later. I don't know. Do you have that feeling that some people have this misconception that is actually no. not true? Spiritual people can be very productive. Yeah. I mean, I think there are two camps. I think there are spiritual people that are, are, are pursuing the spiritual path and they're doing that outside of regular society. So they're living in ashrams or removing themselves from the needs to have a regular job and pay the rent, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But for sure, um, there's, with, with, there's definitely, I, I definitely feel it myself that there's, there's, an, there's, there's, I can see it in other people um, where, not just other people, in people in general, if you have a yoga practice or a centering practice of some sort, a spiritual practice, then you have the ability to concentrate for longer. And the biggest issue that we're having these days because of things like smartphones and being engaged and being reactionary all the time with having notifications and things on, um, people's ability to concentrate is really, really, it's really, it's, it's a very small amount. So the effectiveness when people are working, for sure, is not as effective as someone that has a centering practice like meditation or yoga or mindfulness um, or anything else that keeps you very centered in what you're doing. So absolutely agree with you. Um, I'm very, I'm much more productive and because I keep an awareness of where, how I'm tracking when I'm not a productive and there are unproductive times in my cycle, my menstrual cycle, and I do run my business in alignment with my cycle, that, um, that I now don't schedule things that I need to be really productive on. <laughs> so I do a lot of production when I'm in the energy of having the ability to concentrate and, and, and kind of churn things out. And when I don't have that energy, then I, that's when I schedule other things like contemplation or my creative projects. So I, I think, yeah, for sure, it is a, it's a misconception. Um, and it's, it's an unfortunate reality of society now that we are very distracted and uh, very unable to concentrate for very you know you see it in restaurants even couples can't concentrate on a, a five minute conversation with each other without checking in on their phones yeah. and getting distracted yeah I, I completely agree with you because when i so when i work on my book or doing some serious creative brainstorming or writing i turn off everything like i won't have internet i won't have anything i just spend the two hours doing it but I, I chunked it a lot more and um, it's funny someone called me today in the middle of the day and um, and she kind of like from her question I think she expects that I must be seeing emails constantly and wow. then I actually only check email maybe two or three times a day just so that I know I'm keep on top of things but I don't let it you know some people check the emails way too frequent throughout the day so they get distracted like you said and I actually, I, I realized, oh, so she, she probably think I'll be like looking at it constantly. So when she sends something, immediately will be in front of my eyes. But mm -hmm. it's not like that. Not everyone lives like that. So I love what you said about concentration. And, and I really want to follow up on what you said just a little bit earlier on about uh, you, you, you checking with yourself, but also work along with the moon cycle or menstrual cycle. And I'm the same. I mean, it's a great time to compare notes now because <laughs> what I do is that I am um, uh, uh, like you know for me like you know office I'm pregnant so I don't have to know menstrual cycle but I just you know use it with, with the moon cycle as such but you know maybe you tell us a little bit more about how do you map your work or type of work that you think is most suitable during the cycling of the moon because I think we may be probably following similar strategies so I think yeah. people no, because it's very very cool yeah yeah it is a cool concept there's two things i think even just to reference your idea about productivity as well um just to backtrack to talking about yogic lifestyle there's i i also follow a lot of the similar things that you're talking about i there's um you know i don't my phone is always on silent 
My, I don't have, I don't have any notifications. So I'm pretty much only ever, only ever ringing people back because I don't normally, I won't see when I get a phone call. Mm. And then in that way, I'm able to respond to things rather than react. Um, so I find that that's beneficial for me to be able to stay centered within myself. And I also have one practice that's like a religion for me, and that is on Saturday night, I turn all of my um, my devices off. So my laptop and my phone, I turn them off. And I don't turn them on again until Monday morning. And sometimes it's been extending into Monday afternoon now because I'm trying to extend it out to try and have two days a week. Um, and I call that my sacred Sunday. It's my absolute favorite day of the week because... Um, it also gives me the awareness of how dependent we are on using technology and what a relief to the nervous system it is when we take a break from it. So I don't let a week go by without taking that break. And, um, and I have done more extended periods uh, overseas on trips where it's been up to 10 days of just turning everything off. And I do encourage my ladies to do that when they come on retreat with me. Um, but in reference to talking about living in accordance with your moon cycle, the moon cycle or your menstrual cycle within you and doing business according to that. So we have, um, so I told you I have a daily journaling practice. So in my journaling practice, I write the date and I also write the day of my cycle in order to keep a track of it. And then any main things that are happening with the cycle. So uh, I'm on day eight today. And so day, which is, means I'm, I'm coming up to my fullest amount of energy, which is a great time to be speaking to you and be in the public eye. So day one is um, when we start to bleed and that's our quietest time of the month. Well, it, it should be our quietest time of the month if you're tracking and aware of your cycle. Um, unfortunately, in our culture and the way that we've been initiated into menstruation, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of negativity and uh, taboo even still around the whole menstruating process. So um, many women still don't understand that it's it's a massive um, opportunity to tap into a really big pot of gold and information about yourself in order to know yourself even deeper and to live life with more ease. So if we break the menstrual cycle roughly into four weeks, um, they can be called four weeks and four seasons. So the first week is the, the week that we bleed. And ultimately that's the time when we retreat. So it's our inner winter. So if you think about winter and the kind of what that makes you feel like, you want to rug yourself up and go in, into yourself. You're not really feeling like having any conversations or being around other people. You want to have a little book, a nice cup of tea, and just be quiet and with yourself. So that's week one in the winter. Week two, um, we're coming into spring. So you think of spring, it's exciting. There's some beautiful flowers starting to bloom. You're starting, your estrogen's rising. So you're starting to feel really good about yourself. You're wanting to be out in the world more. And then the peak, uh, peak of the spring is, turns into summer. So we would say the peak of spring into summer is when we ovulate. So that's our peak of our, our month. Mm. And um, after ovulation, our summer is also beautiful into late summer. Um, and then we go, so, so if we think about energetics, winter, don't really want to do anything but very creative time, the darkness of the winter. Um, spring and summer, really outward energetic, can achieve and do a lot of things. And then autumn, starting to descend back into the quiet time again, maybe need to finish a few things off and then prepare to be able to take time off during winter again when you start to bleed. That's kind of the energetics and that's definitely the way that I live with my cycle and how I track um, daily and weekly and also I'm able to track and, and uh, inject the work projects at the right times of my month. So obviously getting onto video, speaking out, speaking in public, hold, hosting events, all of those things I try to do at the peak of my cycle. So in spring and summer, even autumn is okay. And I try not to have to do too much in my winter because the repercussions of not taking a rest during your bleeding time 
uh, that next time um, in your autumn, your premenstrual symptoms will be much, much stronger if you didn't take a rest in the winter. Mm. So our, if we think of our menstrual cycle as the barometer of our well-being, like the report card of how we did for the last month. So uh, it's, it all shows up the next month in the, as far as PMS if you, didn't, if you weren't able to take a rest. And I have to say that in working with a lot of women, um, that slowing down and taking a rest is the biggest <laughs> problem. <laughs> I know, I know. Like even, <laughs> even I talk about this myself and I do think sometimes I realize probably I think I'm resting, but I'm probably doing a little bit too much. But, you know, mm -hmm. I got a quest two actually question, one big, one small probably. So first question is, so let's say people like myself who is pregnant or people in menopause. So do we map it? Do you like, I mean, I, I'm guessing because this is what I was explaining to people who asked me, it will be I'm mapping the, my menstrual similar to the moon. So your winter will be the dark moon or the new moon and then wax uh, and then waxing full moon and then whining will be your second and third week, your spring and summer. And then when it comes to autumn, it's going again, you know, winding, winding further more into the dark moon again. Is it like roughly the same? Would that, would that be yeah. how you will advise if someone like me or in menopause? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So if we're in menopause or even in perimenopause where cycles are erratic and you can't really mm -hmm. track very easily, then um, deaf or post-menopause, then definitely and pregnant with cycle with the moon. So that's that's absolutely correct understanding. So um, we when we cycle with the moon, we cycle with how we would have traditionally cycled with the moon. So in the olden days, when when we were less affected by um, you know hormones and natural light, uh, not synthetic light, artificial light, um, and we lived in communities more, and we we. Um, we had this concept of the red tent, so nomadic communities where all of the women would menstruate at the same time. So they would go into the red tent and um, spend a few days off, which is actually a tradition that's still honoured in India, interestingly. So it's, it's pretty common for women to take the first few days off so that even if you're, if you're, especially if you're a housewife, someone else in the house will take over your duties and you'll take complete rest for two or three days. So um, yeah, the, if we look at the moon cycle related to the inner moon, then traditionally, as you said, it's full moon represents ovulation, uh, where I'm close to, you know, coming into the light and wanting to be out in the world. And then new moon, dark moon represents that quiet inner, in a time, create very creative time, that dark, um, mystical time where kind of the in between land, the mystical, um, liminal time of uh, receiving messages. That's definitely uh, the new moon time. But what we're finding, and and it's still like even I track the the moon cycle with my moon cycle, if you know what I mean. Um, and what we're finding is that many women now, because we're always overdoing it, have flipped their cycles. So they tend to be bleeding at full moon, which makes you feel a bit crazy because you've got all of this big energy happening in nature and you're trying to have this quiet time within yourself and likely you may not even be aware that you need that to be your quiet time. So you're overdoing it. Mm. And then, so we have this, and that's what's called a red, a red moon. So there's this idea of red moon and white moon, and a white moon is the traditional model that you spoke about. And then the red moon is when we bleed at full moon. So it's this kind of um, signal that we're, we're we're doing too much, and we're mm. not under, we're not listening to our bodies, and we're 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 not living with the rhythms of nature that reside within us because we are different on every single day as women. We're not balanced and even our hormonal differences and changes happen daily with, of course, those big peaks and troughs in the cycle that are really obvious. So, um, so interesting. I love it. And I guess ultimately I'm guessing that will be like the, 
to advise will probably be slow down and wondering why you're flipping <laughs> 180 degrees to have the red moon. I mean, probably the signaling, maybe you need to nurture your body or slow down or rest some more. And yeah. um, I guess that's, that's probably I would do. Like, it's so interesting. Once I get my cycle back, I would definitely track it. <laughs> <laughs> but oh the yeah. other thing i want to ask you was about travel so when is good for traveling because i really get about the creative the plotting and to thinking and reflecting what i've learned i get that really clearly or, or starting project finishing it full spin meeting people socializing podcasting but what about traveling what what will be yeah. the good time for that well, I mean, many women notice that their cycles change when they do travel mm. because it does, it does create a vata, a vata disturbance, which is, um, a, you know, if you have an airy nature within you, which is, uh, it comes from Ayurveda, the different doshas, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm vata dominant. And most people have a vata dominance these days because they are externally getting engaged with things so much and they're being on technology all of the time. Then, um, then the best time is of course now for me like it's it's when you're in spring summer even autumn ideally you don't do anything in your winter mm. so i think if there's any kind of you know and there's actually there's no problem in women having a red moon and our cycle changes constantly so you, it's always you know you might have a, an average length of your cycle but it will fluctuate within a few days and sometimes quite extremely depending on what's happening in your life. So it's always an indicator of what's happening in your life. So um, the, the thing that if, if there's only like one takeaway from talking about cycling with the moon is that if you can learn to take a rest, and I know it's not realistic for many women who are holding, you know, holding space for children and partners and, and businesses, um, to take one or two or even the first three days off, but to find some personal time where you can remove yourself from responsibility and just be with yourself and do nothing mm. is the biggest thing that you can do for yourself in order to charge or give energy to the rest of your cycle. Mm. So in particular, because how common is PMS, right? It's a really big issue. And um, it's something that it doesn't feel good for the woman going through it. It doesn't feel good for the, for the people in the woman's life that live with her. And so if we can start to remedy that a little bit by just taking some time out during bleeding time, then that's some big magic that can happen in women's lives. Yeah, I think it's actually a perfect that way to wrap up today's talk um and i think i learned a lot from you and i think it's very i hope people will enjoy this podcast or video if they watch it but okay so ladies wrapping up your homework is to look at your cycle or, or if you don't have, you're not cycling then check out the moon and maybe consider mapping it if if whatever way is possible for you i mean i we talked about a lot of different things that may be better to do in certain week than the others and you know i mean if you have to like plan a party then maybe try not to do it during the winter or, or the, the rest day so that little things that may make a difference so yes yeah, so now i know we, we actually touch on a lot of things so i know you take people to retreat you mentor people so if people want to connect with you online what is the best way they can find you yeah, um, my website's the best, and that's my name, BelindaOday.com, and it's B-E-L-I-N-D-A-O-D-E-A.com. Yes. Uh, on Instagram, I'm at Yoga Travel Wellness, and I'm also on Facebook. So um, I'd love to connect with everyone, and if I wanted one message to be given to all the women that are listening, it would be, please give yourself permission Give yourself permission to rest, give yourself permission to slow down and give yourself permission to say no. Mm. Um, those things will really change your life and help you to live in a more centered and peaceful and happy. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's all, all for me. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much. And I will put your website and your social handle at the bottom of the blog post. And also people, if they click on the details link on the podcast, they can also see that. So don't worry about the spelling, like we'll have the link for you. But thank you so much for today. It's such a wonderful <laughs> time. And hopefully we will maybe do another one about things we didn't touch on, like women's circle, like your travel and wellness retreat, what goes on within those retreats and <laughs> all that stuff. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much.